Chapter 10 of With Cortez in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 10 News from the Coast. It was with a feeling of pleasure and relief that, after some hours, Roger saw the hangings drawn aside and Kakama enter. Come, my friend, the council is over, and you may return with me. Kakama was evidently anxious to be off at once, and Roger followed him without a question. One of the pages of the palace led the way through a long series of passages, and at last Roger found himself outside the palace where a door opened into a canal. Here, Kakama's boat was lying. The young king and Roger took their seats, and the canoe dashed off at once. It has been a hard fight in the council, Kakama said. No two men were of the same opinion. Even the priests were divided among themselves, and Montezuma was as undecided at the end as he was at the beginning, so that the decision is postponed. Then the question arose, were you going to be treated as a guest or as a prisoner? And this I settled by saying that I would take you back with me to Tezcuco and produce you whenever required. So in order to avoid excitement among the people, I sent word for the boat to be brought round to that quiet entrance to the palace, by which means we avoided passing through the streets altogether. At one time it seemed to me that the decision would go against you on the ground that, had you been a supernatural being, you would have had new arts to teach the people. Fortunately, I had brought with me the pictures you made for my wife and sister, and these I showed them. I pointed out that they were altogether different from the work of our own scribes, that these drew stiff images that looked like representations not of men and animals, but of wooden creatures, while in your drawings it seemed as if the men and animals were moving across the paper, and that, were you to teach our scribes thus to portray objects, it would make a profound alteration in Mexican art. This made a great impression upon them. Many of the nobles belonging to the Council of Education were present, and Montezuma himself is fond of art. All were greatly struck with your paintings, and these certainly went a long way towards strengthening my party. When we get back, you shall do some pictures of things such as they see here and are accustomed to. Perhaps you could do even better still if you were to try. I could make much more finished pictures, Roger said. These were only sketched off in haste and with such colors as came to hand but if I had pigments and could mix the colors as I wanted them, I could produce very much better effect. Roger, as a child, had been placed by his father during the latter's long absences from home at a school kept by some monks at a monastery at Plymouth in order that he might learn to read and write, as these accomplishments would be of great use to him as a master mariner. His fondness for painting attracted the attention of one of the old monks who illuminated missiles, and he had permitted him to copy many of the manuscripts in the monastery and had given him instructions in the art. He had, indeed, been so struck with the talent the boy showed that he told Reuben Hawkshaw that if he would let his son devote himself to art, he would make a famous painter. The sailor had scoffed at the idea and Roger himself, fond as he was of painting, would have been reluctant to abandon the idea of going to sea. The instructions he had obtained, however, up to the age of twelve, when he went on his first voyage with his father, had been of great assistance to him. Thanks to his natural talent, his visits to the churches at the various ports at which the ship touched, and to the fact that he had plenty of time on board to practice the art, his pictures were surprisingly good, 
and had excited a great deal of attention on the part of the friends and acquaintances of master diggory beggs upon his return to tezcuco cacama ordered the scribes to furnish him with large sheets of the best paper brushes and pigments the colors were all bright and glaring ones but by mixing them and adding some sombre dyes he obtained in the market roger succeeded in getting the required tints taking his place in the garden at a point where he commanded the lake near at hand dotted with canoes and the city of mexico with its background of hills in the distance roger set to work to the surprise of the scribe who had been ordered to assist him he mixed the colors with oil instead of water and then began his pictures he worked as long as there was sufficient light and recommenced it the next morning directly after sunrise and continued at work all day and by evening had finished the picture three feet by two which although it would not be considered remarkable in europe excited the most lively admiration on the part of cacama and the ladies he explained to the king that as he had none of the spirit that was used in conjunction with the oil to make it dry rapidly it would be some days before the picture would be sufficiently dry to be touched cacama however sent it off the next morning under charge of his principal scribe to montezuma who sent back word that he was astonished indeed at this work of art which seemed to him to be almost magical and he sent in return a large golden goblet to roger in token of his satisfaction cacama was summoned to a council on the following day and returned saying that the picture had quite turned the scale in roger's favor that it had been examined by the chief scribes and the men of science who all agreed that no such thing had been seen before and that a person who was thus able to turn as it were a leaf of paper into a mirror to fix upon it the representation of scenes just as the eye beheld them must be possessed of powers altogether strange and supernatural they desired to know whether he would teach his methods to some of the chief scribes of the emperor cacama warmly congratulated roger on the result you are now safe for the present at any rate he said and the priests are silenced you may have trouble in the future but for the time montezuma's love of art has overcome his doubts and fears as to good and evil omens shall i have to take up my residence in mexico i hardly think so cacama replied tezcuco is still acknowledged the centre of the arts and sciences of anahuac here are the best schools of the scribes and they come here to be instructed in hieroglyphic writing from all parts of the kingdom moreover in that way montezuma will have less uneasiness concerning you he will think that even if the omens be unfavorable there will be no danger so long as you are at a distance from his capital therefore i think he is more likely to order some of the scribes to take up their residence here for a time than he is to bid you to cross to teach them there such in fact was the purport of the message received from montezuma on the following day six of the most accomplished scribes of mexico were to proceed at once to tezcuco there to be instructed in the new art and the next day roger found himself established in a room in the palace with the six aztec scribes and six of those most celebrated for their skill in tezcuco some attendants were told off to mix colors under his directions and to purchase for him in the market all kinds of dyes and colors he might require a male and female slave were at roger's request placed at his service to act as models and the attendants had orders to fetch from the cages and aviaries any beasts and birds he might desire to copy roger had at first some difficulty in preserving his gravity at thus undertaking charge of an art school at first he confined himself to sketching from the models with a burnt stick on the white paper and in seeing that his pupils did the same their drawing had hitherto been purely conventional they had always drawn a man in a certain way 
not because they saw him so, but because that was the way in which they had been taught to draw him, and he had great difficulty in getting them to depart altogether from these lines, and to draw the model exactly as he stood before them. What he called his school hours lasted but four hours a day, and as he did this work in the middle of the day, when it was too hot to go out, but very pleasant in the rooms with their thick walls and semi-shaded windows, it interfered but little with his daily life. He had now a set of apartments next to those of Cuitcatl with attendants to wait upon him, but his time was spent as much in the young noble's rooms as in his own. In the morning they walked together, either in the town or beyond its walls. In the evening they spent hours upon the lake, sometimes in large canoes, with gay parties, the boats decked with flowers, while at a short distance another boat with musicians followed in their wake. The melody, which was by no means agreeable to Roger when close, coming softly across the water. With Cuitcatl as a guide, Roger visited the schools where the young nobles were educated, and which reminded him much of that at which he had, for five or six years, been taught. He also frequently witnessed the drilling of the soldiers. This was of a very simple character, consisting principally in teaching them to move together in masses and to shoot with a bow. The bows were light and the arrows small, and Roger thought that they could scarcely be very formidable weapons, even against men clad in quilted cotton, for although they might wound and annoy, they could seldom kill. One evening, about five months after his arrival, Roger had just returned from an excursion upon the lake, and he and Cuitcatl were seated in the latter's rooms, sipping chocolate, when the hangings of the door were drawn aside suddenly, and Amenche entered. With an exclamation of surprise, the two young men rose to their feet and saluted deeply. "'You must fly!' she exclaimed to Roger, and at once. The royal boat has just come from Mexico, with two nobles and a guard. They have orders to carry you back with them. The news has arrived that several floating castles filled with white men with strange arms and animals, have arrived on the coast. Secret council has been held, and Montezuma is full of alarm. The priests have decided that you are undoubtedly a spy, and must be sacrificed at once to the gods. I happened to be behind the hanging, heard what was said, and hurried away to warn you. There is not a moment to lose. Go round to the garden, and conceal yourself in the shrubbery near the Eagle House. I will tell Kakama where you are, and he will come or send down to you to say what had best be done and where you are to go. Do not delay an instant. The orders were urgent, and they will be here in a minute or two to seize you. Not a word. Now, go. I must not be found here. I will see you again. And she was gone. Come, my friend, Cuitcatl said, there is evidently not a moment to be lost. Roger ran into his room, emptied from a drawer where they were lying the gold ornaments and presents he had received, and tied them in a cloth, caught up his sword, and then, with Kuit Cottle, hurried down the passage. Just as they reached the end, they saw a party appear at the other extremity, preceded by an official carrying torches. "'We are but just in time,' the young noble said, the princess has saved your life. In two or three minutes they were in the garden, and keeping carefully in the shade of the shrubs, so as to escape the view of any who might be sitting at the windows or on the flat roof of the palace, enjoying the lovely evening and the bright moonlight. They made their way cautiously down to the Eagle House, which lay at the other end of the garden, nearly half a mile from the palace. The whole thing had come so suddenly upon Roger that he could scarcely believe, even now, that his pleasant and tranquil time had come to an end, and he was in danger of being dragged away and instantly sacrificed. Scarce a word was spoken till they reached the spot indicated. Close to this grew a large patch of bamboos. "'We will take refuge here for the present,' Cuitcatl said. It is hardly likely they will search the gardens at night. It would need an army to do so thoroughly. 
if we hear footsteps approaching we can take refuge inside and meantime let us seat ourselves here these must be the people you told us of the first night you came no doubt they are so but Cuitcatl, you had best return at once to your chamber you will be missed as well as i shall and it would be suspected that you had a share in my flight and if i should make my escape the emperor's vengeance may fall on you pray leave me at once i should be most unhappy if my misfortunes brought trouble upon you you have been like a brother to me since i came here i should not think of leaving you the young noble said firmly but you can do me more good by going Cuitcatl. you will see what is taking place there and may throw them off the scent while here you can do me no good whatever and indeed might do me harm were i found here with you i should be forced to surrender without striking a blow for i should be afraid to resist lest i should bring harm upon you whereas if i am alone i would fight to the death rather than surrender besides you will be able to consult the princess and can bring down such things as you may consider will aid me in my flight though how i am to escape the search there will be after me is more than i can guess pray go at once for the sooner you go the sooner you can bring me back news of what is being done up there cuitcatl saw the justice of roger's reasoning i may at least throw them off the scent he said and see about preparing for your flight you promise to hide in the bamboos there if searchers should come in this direction certainly i do i will do all in my power to conceal myself and will only fight if there be no other way cuitcatl at once glided noiselessly off keeping as before in the shadow of the bushes for an hour and a half roger remained alone he was sitting under the shadow of the bamboos and could in a moment withdraw himself among them at last he thought he heard a slight noise and drew back towards the thick canes a moment later however he stepped forward as a figure he at once recognized advanced across a patch of moonlight from the next clump of shrubs all is well so far cuitcatl said directly i entered the palace an attendant told me that i was being inquired for and i proceeded straight to the royal apartments montezuma's messengers were there they at once asked me if i had seen you i said yes that we had been walking together but that you had not returned with me as you said that the night was so lovely you should remain out for some time longer they asked me if i could lead them to where you were but i said that you had not told me which way you should go and you might for aught i knew have taken a canoe and gone for a moonlight row on the lake as was often your custom orders have been issued to the city guard to arrest you immediately wherever you might be found and the envoys themselves started at once with the guard they had brought with them to the waterside up to that time cacama who had not left them was in ignorance what had become of you and i could see he was anxious and much troubled do you know where he is he asked me as soon as we were alone would it not be better your majesty i said that you should remain in ignorance should he escape montezuma will be furious and it might be well that you should be able to affirm on your oath that you knew nothing of him and were in no way privy to his escape but is there a chance of his escaping he asked we will do what we can i said and we can do no more with a disguise a guide and arms roger hawkshaw may be able to make his way through the country in spite of montezuma and his army i should think that the best thing will be to get him into a small canoe take him to the end of the lake and land him near tepichpan then he can strike up north take to the hills there and then journey east all the roads direct from here will be so guarded that it will be impossible to get through the search will be close everywhere but there will be more chance of escape on that line than from here but how about the guide whom can we trust i have one of my hunters in the town he brought some game down from my estate today and was not to return until tomorrow i know where he lodges 
He is a brave fellow, and carried my banner in the last campaign. "'You will let me know before he starts?' the king asked. "'I will, your majesty. The moon will not be down for three hours yet, and he cannot attempt to fly until it has set.' As I left the royal apartment, one of the female attendants came up and, putting her finger on her lip, signed to me to follow her. I did so, and she led me to the apartment where the queen and Princess Amenche were awaiting me. "'You have left your friends safe, Kuitkatl? the queen said. "'The princess has told me the part she has taken in the affair. It was foolish, but I cannot blame her, though if Montezuma knew by whose means the prey had slipped from his fingers, the least she could expect would be to be ordered to retire for life to one of the temples. Have you formed any plans?' I told her what I had thought of. That seems as good a plan as any other, she said. He will need paints to disguise himself, the dress of a peasant, and arms. He has his sword, I said. He cannot take that. Its golden handle would betray him at once. A heavy woodman's axe and a bow and spear would be the most suitable. He shall have them, I said. My hunter shall take them and place them in the canoe, in readiness." What are you going to do now? I am going first into the town to give my hunter his instructions, and bid him be at the lake entrance to the gardens half an hour after the moon has set. I shall want the key of the gate. Next I shall go down and tell Roger what preparations have been made, and then return here, for it is best I should be seen in the palace. Then, just as the moon sets, I shall go down again to him." Come here on your way, Kuitkatl. I shall go down with Amenche to say good-bye to him. This obstinate girl has determined to go, and I cannot let her go alone. As soon as I left them, I went down to the town and found my hunter, who has taken a vow to lay down his life to save you, if necessary. Here are some peasant's clothes, a coarse cotton mantle, and a short skirt. Here is a jar of dye. You had better strip at once and let me color you, and then put on these clothes. It will be too dark to see to do it properly when I return. Besides, time will be short then. This small jar contains some dye from the juice of a plant which will turn your hair black, at least, as they use it for dyeing the skins of animals black, I suppose it will affect your hair. Roger at once took off his gaudy attire and was stained from head to foot with the contents of the jug, and then rubbed his hair with the liquid from the smaller vessel. Then he put on the peasant's clothes. "'You will pass well now,' Kuitkatl said, heading him out into the moonlight, so that he could obtain a good view of him. "'It is only your height that is against you. Still, some men are taller than others, though I never saw one as tall as you, and you will certainly be stared at. Is there anything else in the way of arms you would like, besides the axe and spear? I shall make myself a bow and arrows when we get fairly away, Roger said. I did not know you could use them. I could not use such little things as those your people carry, but we still use the bow in England, and every boy is obliged by law to practice with it. With such a bow as I should make, I could send an arrow three times as far as those puny weapons of yours, and could keep my foes at a distance, whereas otherwise they could shoot me down as they chose. They will not shoot you down, Kuitkatl said. You may be quite sure that the orders will be to take you alive, and this will give you a great advantage if you are attacked. But I must be going up now to the palace again to show myself, for a time, among our friends. Just as the moon sets, I will be here." "'Will you thank the queen and princess for their kindness?' Roger said, and say that, much as I should like to say good-bye to them, I would not that they should run any risks by coming to see me. "'They will come,' Kuitkatl said, unless I am greatly mistaken. The princess would come, even if her uncle Montezuma were himself watching her. Roger sat down again and watched the moon going down. He felt a certain sense of exhilaration at the thought that he was about to enter upon a life of active adventure again. It had seemed to him lately 
that his life was to be spent in this strange country, cut off from all chances of ever returning to England, and that sooner or later he was assuredly destined to form a part of their hideous sacrifices. The party against him had been silenced for a moment, but would be sure to gather strength again, and he would be called upon either to worship these blood-stained idols or to die. Life was pleasant enough as it was at present with the friendship of the young king and the kindness of the queen and princess, but he would soon be tired of it with its everlasting sunshine and its flowers and its idleness. At last the moon set, and in a few minutes he heard footsteps approaching, and Cuitcatl and two veiled figures came up. The queen came straight up to him. "'We are very sorry to lose you, Roger Hawkshaw,' she said gently, "'and were there a hope of doing so successfully, we would defy the cruel orders from Montezuma, but it would bring ruin on our people.' "'I know that it cannot be done, madam,' Roger said. "'I thank you and the king most heartily for all your kindness to me. "'If I escape to my own country, I shall remember it all my life, "'and I will pray to the god we worship to give you happiness.' "'Take this,' the queen said, putting a small bag into his hand. "'You have told me that these gems are as much prized among your people as they are here.' and you can more easily conceal them than gold. I have taken them, with the king's permission, from the royal treasure, and should you reach your distant home in safety, they ought to make you rich for the rest of your life. And now farewell. Whatever the priests may say, Kakama and I know that you came as a friend, and meant us no harm. Now, Amenche, she said, come and say good-bye. The girl came forward slowly, she took Roger's hand and gazed up into his face. She seemed to try to speak, and then Roger felt her sway suddenly and caught her just as she would have fallen. "'Give her to me,' the queen said. "'It is best so, by far. Hurry away, Roger. You have done harm enough without meaning it. Cuitcatl, take him away at once.' The young noble took Roger's hand and hurried him away. "'What is the matter?' he asked, bewildered. What did the queen mean, that I had done harm enough? Do you mean to say that you have not seen that Amentia loves you? I never dreamed of such a thing, Roger exclaimed. Kakama and the queen, and all of us who have seen her with you, knew it long ago, and had it not been for this unlucky news today, Kakama would, in a short time, have offered you her hand. There has been a scene tonight between her and her brother for she declared that she would go with you and share your dangers whatever they might be she has for the last three hours been confined in her chamber and she was only allowed to come down to say good-bye to you on her swearing that she would return with the queen to her room i am awfully sorry roger said i never dreamed of such a thing the princess has always been very kind to me but I should never have thought of raising my eyes so high. Besides, as I have told you, I am still scarce a man, and with us one does not think of marriage until he is five or six years older than I am. No one blames you at all, Cuitcatl said. The king and queen both told her that they were sure you had not thought of her in that way, though they naturally supposed that, had you remained here, you would have gladly formed such an alliance when it was offered you. However, it is no use talking any more about it. You will have difficulties enough before you, and would have had no chance whatever of getting through them if encumbered with her. Kakama told her so, but she scoffed at the idea of danger. Mexican women, when they love, are ready for any sacrifice. Kakama did not press that, but chiefly spoke of the terrible scandal it would be were she, his sister and the niece of Montezuma, to be brought back with you, a captive. They were now at the gate. Cuitcatl opened it and locked it again after him. A figure was standing outside. This is my follower. You may rely upon him to serve you to the last. Bathalda, this is my white friend. You will serve him as you would me. The man took Roger's hand and carried it to his forehead. "'My life is yours, my lord,' he said. 
"'Is everything ready, Bathalda?' asked Cuitcatl. "'Yes, my lord. I have the canoe hidden among the rocks, with the arms and some food. It is but a few hundred yards away.' "'Let us be off, then, at once,' Cuitcatl said. The man led the way down to the lake, and then along the shore for some little distance. "'There is the canoe,' he said. Cuitcatl embraced Roger. "'I wish that I could go with you, my white brother, and share your dangers down to the coast,' he said. "'But I could aid you but little, and my life would be forfeited on my return. May the gods of Mexico and the god you worship protect you. It may be, who knows, that some day you may return hither. Cuitcatl's heart will be rejoiced to see you.' "'Thank you for all your kindness,' Roger said. "'Whatever befalls me, I shall never forget it. "'Thank Kakama for all he has done in my favor, "'and say good-bye for me to the princess. "'Tell her that it is better so, "'for that so soft a flower would soon droop "'and pine away in my cold country.' "'Roger took his seat in the canoe. "'Bathalda seized the paddle, "'and the little boat shot out from the shore.' For some distance they kept close in under the shadow of the land, Bathalda saying that two or three royal canoes were rowing up and down opposite the town, and that every canoe putting off had been stopped and questioned. Several times, when the sound of a paddle was heard out on the lake, Bathalda stopped rowing for a time. But after keeping close to the shore for an hour, he struck out more boldly, and after two hours further rowing, approached the shore again. "'This is the point where we must land,' he said. Four hours' walking will take us among the hills. But before we leave the canoe, we will half fill it with stones, then knock a hole in her bottom, and push her out into the lake to sink. Were she found here in the morning, it might afford a clue as to the way we had taken.' This was done, and then they started for the hills. Alone, Roger would have had great difficulty in making his way along the paths running between the cultivated fields, but his companion led the way without hesitation, seeing, apparently, as well as if it had been broad daylight. Roger carried the axe, which was a heavy one, on one shoulder, and in the other hand the spear, which he used as a walking stick. Before daylight broke they were ascending the hills, which were wild and rugged, they passed several villages lying high up on rugged hilltops, and inaccessible save by ladders, which could be drawn up in case of attack. The tribes here have only recently been conquered, Bathalda said. They pay tribute to Mexico, but are a wild race, and as there is nothing to be obtained from them but hard knocks, they are but little interfered with. Getting deeper among the hills, Bathalda, just as morning was breaking, led the way up a ravine down which a little stream trickled, and found a resting place among a number of great rocks that had fallen from above. Here, he said, we shall be perfectly safe for the day. It is not likely that even a shepherd will enter this ravine, and if he does, he is not likely to come upon us here. First, let us eat our breakfast, and then we will lie down and sleep till evening. I will keep watch if you like, but I do not think there is any occasion for it. Not the least, Roger agreed. We had both better get what sleep we can. We shall have a long tramp before us tonight. They were undisturbed during the day, and, as soon as the sun set, were again on their feet. The journey was a toilsome one. The country was so broken that they were continually either climbing the steep hills or descending into the valleys. After the moon had set, they were forced to come to a halt for some hours, finding it impossible to climb the steep hills in the darkness. With the first light of day, they were again in motion, and continued walking for some hours. There, Bathalda said at last, as he gained the brow of the hill, that is the plateau land. The town you see there, away on our right, is Atampan. Now we will keep due west, there are no large towns now till we reach Tlatlan, Quidipac, and Perote. From that point our danger will be the greatest, for all the roads across the mountains are sure to be watched. The guards at the station houses on these roads have, no doubt, by this time, had orders to look for you and arrest you. 
but by traveling at night we may pass them safely we may as well enter that field of maize and lie down until evening after that we will follow a path till we gain a main road and then travel straight on we can go so much faster on a road than through the fields and i know where the post houses are situated so we can make a detour to avoid them that night they walked as far as roger could guess fifty miles and again entered a very hilly country in the morning they left the road and encamped in a wood far up the hillside during the day they saw several parties of troops following the road and many couriers passed along at a swift run the whole country is up bathalda said we shall have to be very careful in future the first night while passing through the low hot country near the lake roger had cut a strong bamboo together with a bundle of smaller rods suitable for arrows bathalda had brought with him a bag of sharp obsidian arrowheads and some feathers for winging them together with a bowstring of twice the ordinary strength he had looked on with amusement when roger cut the bamboo making it as was the custom of english archers of his own height my lord is not intending that surely for a bow he said yes bathalda i think that will do well roger said trying with his knee the stiffness of the cane at the halt next day roger had cut the notches for the string now bathalda he said can you string this no my lord nor can any other man i think it is about the strength of the bows we use at home roger said the stringing them is a matter of knack as well as of strength and to the amazement of the aztec he strung the bow now said he let us make some arrows they should be a cloth yard in length that is from the middle of my chest to the end of my middle finger a dozen of the light bamboos were cut to this length the huntsman fitted the obsidian points to them and roger stepped back a hundred yards from the small tree with a trunk some six inches in diameter under whose shade they had been sitting then he fitted the arrow to the string bent the bow to its head and loosed the arrow it struck the trunk but glanced off i am out of practice indeed he said or i should have hit that fair in the centre to the huntsman however the shot seemed well-nigh miraculous the distance being twice as great as the mexican bows would carry with anything like accuracy while the speed with which the arrow flew and the distance it went after glancing from the tree showed that it would have been fatal at least fifty yards beyond the object aimed at taking the bow from roger he fitted another arrow in and tried to bend it but with all his efforts could only draw the arrow four or five inches it is wonderful he said returning the weapon to roger if i had not seen it done i could not have believed it it is merely a matter of practice roger said my people are famous for their dexterity with the bow and i have seen men hit a mark no bigger than the palm of my hand ten times in succession at that distance the next time they halted bathalda made the rest of the bamboos into arrows and making a quiver of the bark of a tree hung them over his shoulder roger left his spear behind using the bow which he had unstrung as a walking staff bathalda offered to carry the spear in addition to his own weapon but roger told him that he did not care about it if it should come to a hand-to-hand -hand fight he said i would rather rely on my axe besides the bow now it is unstrung makes an excellent quarterstaff a weapon with which i have practised a great deal with a spear your people would know quite as much as i should but i fancy that with a quarterstaff i should astonish them it has the advantage too that it disables without killing and as your soldiers would only be doing their duty in arresting me i should be sorry to do them more harm than i could help there were a great many men on the road below there to-day a great many my lord and no doubt the garrisons of the two towns we shall have to pass to-night will be all out and on the watch this is the most dangerous part of the journey the mountains are rugged and there are only certain passes by which we can travel 
and they are sure to be watched narrowly. They will guess that we shall travel by night. I suppose it will not be possible to make a detour, either to the south or north? The Aztec shook his head. To the north lie terrible mountains, of whose passes I know nothing. Our provisions are exhausted, and we must, in future, depend upon maize and other things we can pick by the way. Were we to go there, we should find nothing. To the south lies Tlaxcala, whose people are independent of Montezuma. They are fierce and warlike, and would seize and offer you to the gods without pity. Still, they would not be on the lookout for us, and we might, therefore, pass through their country without being seen. We might do so, my lord, Bathalda agreed. At any rate, Roger said, it seems to me that there would be more chance in that direction than in going straight forward. From what you say, it seems well nigh impossible for us to get through the passes ahead of us without being captured. Accordingly, when night fell, they struck off to the south. The journey was a very toilsome one, for they were now crossing the spurs of the hills, running far down into the plateau. As before, they had to halt when the moon set, but continued their way at daybreak. There is a road down in the valley there, Roger said, after three hours more walking. Bethalda stood looking down for some time. I know it now, he said. It is the last road north of Tlaxcala, and runs from Hujotlapan to Yuxtacamuxtitlan. We are already east of Tlaxcala, and about fifteen miles from Yuxtacamuxtitlan. If we get past that town without accident, we shall then have to cross the pass of Obispo, over the great range of mountains, and come down near Nalinko. Once past that town, our dangers will be over, for there are few towns and villages in the Tierra Caliente. Our great danger will lie in the pass. There are but two or three roads across these mountains, and they will know that we must follow them. Well, we must take our chance, Roger said. So far we have met with no difficulties whatever, and provided we don't come across too large a force, we ought to be able to manage to get through. I noticed there were trees right through the pass I came over, and I see the country ahead is thickly wooded. How far is the pass from where we are now? About thirty miles. It is where you see that cleft in the great line of hills. Well, we can get near it before the moon sets, and we'll try to pass through by daylight. It would be useless attempting to make our way through the trees at night, and if we have to fight, I would rather do so in the light. We will lie down now, for I own I am completely tired out. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of With Cortes in Mexico by G. A. Henty This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Cortes in Mexico by G. A. Henty Chapter 11 Cortes The expedition, whose arrival had caused such excitement in Mexico, was commanded by Hernando Cortes, a man who united in his person all the gifts requisite for a great leader of men. He possessed a handsome person, great strength and skill at arms, extraordinary courage and daring, singular powers of conciliation and of bringing others to his way of thinking, pleasing and courteous demeanour, a careless and easy manner which concealed great sagacity and wisdom, an inexhaustible flow of spirits, and an iron determination. Born in Estremadura in 1485, of an ancient and respectable family, he was, like many others who have distinguished themselves as great soldiers, while at school and college, remarkable rather for mischievous freaks and disregard of authority than for love of learning. At the age of seventeen, he had exhausted his parents' patience, and was on the point of starting with the expedition of Ovando, the successor to Columbus, when he so injured himself by a fall, 
incurred in one of his wild escapades, that he was unable to sail with it. Two years later, however, he went out in a merchant vessel to the Indies. On reaching Hispaniola, Ovando, who was governor of the island, received him kindly, and gave him a grant of land and a number of Indians to till it. The quiet life of the planter, however, little suited the restless young fellow, and after taking part in several military expeditions against insurgent natives, under the command of Diego Velasquez, he sailed in 1511 with that officer to undertake the conquest of Cuba. He displayed great courage and activity during the campaign, and his cheerful manner and fund of high spirits made him a great favourite with the soldiers. When the fighting was over, Cortes soon became discontented with the quiet life in the island, and joined a party of men who were disaffected to Velasquez, owing to their not having received such rewards as they considered their services merited. Cortes undertook to carry their complaints to the governor of Hispaniola, and was about starting when the matter came to the ears of Velasquez, who seized him, put him in irons, and threw him into prison. He was not long in making his escape, and sought sanctuary in a church. But a few days later, when carelessly strolling outside its walls, he was again seized and imprisoned. He was put on board a ship to be sent to Hispaniola, there to be tried for exciting disaffection and revolt. But at night, before she set sail, he managed to free himself from his irons, gain the deck, and swim ashore, where he again took refuge in the church. Here several influential people interfered on his behalf, among them the family of Catalina Zuarez, a young lady to whom he was engaged, and a reconciliation was brought about between him and the governor. Cortes received a large estate, with an ample number of Indians for its cultivation, married and settled down, and for some years devoted himself to agriculture and gold mining. Success attended him, and he accumulated some three thousand castellanos, a considerable sum. So he might have lived and died, had not the news of discoveries made by Grijalva, who had sailed west and discovered Yucatan, and traded with Tabasco, and had returned with a good deal of gold and wonderful tales of fabulous wealth, existing in a great nation farther to the north, the governor at once prepared to fit out a large expedition, and among the many who offered to undertake its command, and to contribute largely towards its expenses, he finally selected Cortes, who had gained the ear and influence of the governor's secretary, Duero, and the royal treasurer, Lares. Cortes was appointed captain-general of the expedition, and at once set to work, with his accustomed energy, to gather material for it. He not only contributed all the fortune he had made, but raised funds by mortgaging his estates to their full value, and by borrowing money from merchants and others, on security of the wealth that was to be acquired by the expedition. His personal popularity in the island enabled him to gather numerous recruits, and many of his intimate friends, who joined him, assisted him from their own resources, or by raising money on their estates. Velasquez himself contributed comparatively little towards the expenses, which were almost entirely borne by Cortes and his friends. Six ships were fitted out, and three hundred recruits enrolled. The instructions Cortes received were first to find Grijalva, and join in company with him, to visit Yucatan, and endeavour to rescue six Christians, who were reported as still living there, the survivors of a vessel wrecked years before on the coast. He was to make a survey of the whole coastline, to acquaint himself with the natural productions of the country, and with the character and institutions of the native races. He was to barter with the natives, and to treat them with kindness and humanity, and to remember above all things that the object the emperor had most at heart was the conversion of the Indians. 
he was to invite them to give in their allegiance to the king and to send such presents as would ensure his favour and protection the governor gave no directions for colonising or conquering having received no warrant from spain that would enable him to invest his agent with such powers but while cortez was preparing to start many of the leading men of the island who were jealous of his rapid rise roused the suspicions of velasquez against him saying that when he had once sailed he would no longer recognize the governor's authority and would be thinking only of winning renown and wealth for himself velasquez determined to appoint another commander but duero and lares to whom he confided his intentions at once informed cortez of them with the same promptitude that always distinguished him in moments of danger cortez went round to his officers after nightfall got them and his men on board visited the contractor carried off all his stock of meat giving him a massive gold chain in security for payment and before daybreak the fleet left its moorings and the sails were hoisted as soon as the news was carried to velasquez he hurriedly dressed and rowed down to the shore cortez when he saw him got into a boat and rowed to within speaking distance this is a courteous way of taking leave indeed the angry governor said i was pressed for time cortez replied there are some things that should be done even before they are thought of has your excellency any orders velasquez saw by the innuendo in the words of cortez that the latter was aware of his intention to deprive him of his command he had no orders to give for it was evident that cortez would not obey them the latter therefore returned to his vessel and the fleet instantly set sail for the port of macaca this was in november fifteen sixteen the act of cortez was doubtless one of insubordination but after he had embarked the whole of his resources in the expedition and had received the command from the governor this being ratified by the authorities of hispaniola it could hardly be expected that he would submit to disgrace and ruin being brought not only upon himself but upon all the friends who had aided him in the enterprise at macaca cortez laid in some more stores and then sailed for trinidad an important town on the southern coast of cuba here he issued proclamations inviting recruits to join him these came in considerable numbers among them a hundred men from grialva's ship which had just before reached the port what was still more important several cavaliers of high family and standing joined him among them the alvarados olid avia velasquez de leon a near relation of the governor and sandoval he purchased at trinidad large military stores and provisions while he was taking these and other steps to strengthen his position verdugo the commander of the town received letters from velasquez ordering him to seize cortez but upon his communicating these orders to the principal officers of the expedition they pointed out to him that if he attempted to take such a grave step the soldiers and sailors would certainly resist it and the town would not improbably be laid in ashes the expedition then sailed round the island to havana where cortez completed his preparations and in spite of another ineffectual attempt of velasquez to detain him set sail in the time that had intervened between the inception of the expedition and its departure the historians agree that a remarkable change had come over cortez he was still frank and pleasant in his manner courteous and cheery with all but he was no longer the gay careless character who had been liked but scarcely greatly respected in the island his whole actions were marked by an air of resolute determination and authority he himself superintended every detail of work and exhibited a thoughtfulness prudence and caution 
that seemed alien to his former character he was immensely popular both among his soldiers and officers but all felt that he was entitled to their respect as well as their liking and that he was not only commander but thoroughly master of the expedition although extremely careless himself as to food comfort or appearance he now assumed the state befitting his appointment and authority he dressed handsomely but quietly appointed officers and domestics for his household and placed it on the footing of a man of high station before sailing he dispatched a letter to velasquez begging him to rely on his devotion to his interests on february the tenth fifteen nineteen the expedition started it consisted of eleven vessels only one of which was as large as a hundred tons of a hundred and ten sailors five hundred and fifty three soldiers and two hundred indians of the islands there were ten heavy guns and four light ones and sixteen horses before sailing cortez gave an address to his soldiers and aroused their enthusiasm to the utmost he had the advantage of obtaining the services as chief pilot of alaminos a veteran who had acted as pilot to columbus on his last voyage and to grijalva in his late expedition soon after they started they met with a storm and put in at the island of cozumal and cortez then sent orders to yucatan to try to recover the captives said to be there that officer returned without tidings but before the fleet sailed a canoe arrived containing one of them aquila who had been wrecked there eight years previously he had been a priest and had so won the esteem and reverence of the barbarians among whom he lived that they had with great reluctance allowed him to depart in exchange for glass beads and other trinkets promised by ordaz the fleet now sailed along the coast of yucatan until they reached the mouth of the tabasco river where grijalva had carried on so profitable a trade leaving the ships at anchor they ascended the river in boats but instead of meeting with the friendly reception that grijalva had done they found the banks lined with the natives whose menacing attitude showed that a landing would be opposed after solemnly summoning them to surrender cortez landed the natives fought bravely but were unable to resist the astounding effects of the spaniards firearms and the invaders advancing drove them back and took possession of the town which was found to be deserted two strong parties were sent out next morning to reconnoitre but were attacked and driven back to the town they reported that the whole country was under arms cortez was much vexed at finding himself thus engaged in a war from which no benefit was to be gained but he felt that it would impair the confidence of his troops were he now to draw back he therefore landed six of the guns and the horses and the following day sallied out to the attack ordaz commanded the infantry while cortez himself led the little body of cavalry the horses being mounted by the cavaliers of the party after marching a league the infantry came in sight of the enemy the natives attacked them as they were struggling through deeply irrigated ground poured volleys of missiles of all kinds upon them and wounded many before they could get across to solid ground where they could bring the guns into play but even these and the discharges of musketry did not appall the natives who pressed forward with such fury that after the engagement had lasted an hour the position of the spaniards became perilous in the extreme but at this moment cortez and his companions who had been compelled to make a great detour owing to the difficult nature of the ground fell suddenly upon the rear of the enemy the latter who had never before seen horses and who believed that horse and rider were the same animal was seized with a sudden panic at this extraordinary apparition 
the panic speedily communicated itself to the whole army, and while the cavalry trampled down and slaughtered many in the rear, the infantry charged, and the Indians fled in wild confusion. Great numbers had fallen, whilst on the Christian side a few only were killed, and a hundred wounded. No pursuit was attempted. Cortes released the prisoners taken in battle, among whom were two chiefs, and sent them to their countrymen, with a message that he would forgive the past if they would at once come in and tender their submission. Otherwise he would ride over the land and put every living creature to the sword. The Tabascans, cowed by the dreadful thunder weapons and by the astounding armed creatures that had fallen upon them, had no wish for further fighting, and the principal caziques soon came in with offerings to propitiate the Spaniards. Among these were twenty female slaves, one of whom turned out a more valuable gift to the Spaniards than all the other presents put together. Among the gifts were only a few small gold ornaments, and when asked where the metal was procured, they pointed to the northwest and said Mexico. As there was nothing to be done here, the Spaniards prepared to depart, but before doing so, insisted on the people consenting to become Christians. As they had but little idea of what was required by them, and were in no mood for argument with the Spaniards, a solemn mass was held, at which the whole people became nominally Christians. Re-embarking, the Spaniards sailed along the coast, until they reached the island of San Juan de Oloa, and anchored in the strait between it and the mainland. A canoe speedily came off from the latter, with presents of fruit and flowers, and small gold trinkets, which the natives willingly bartered with the Spaniards. Cortes was, however, unable to converse with them, for Aguilar, who had acted as interpreter with the Tabascans, was unable to understand their dialect. Presently, however, the female slaves informed him that one of their number, named Malinche, was a native of Mexico, and spoke that language as well as the tongue of the Tabascans. She was at once installed as interpreter, she informing Aquilar what the Mexicans said, and he interpreting it to Cortes. By this means he learned that the Indians were subjects of the great Mexican Empire, which was ruled over by a monarch named Montezuma, whose capital lay seventy leagues from the coast. A strong force at once landed on the mainland, and threw up a fortified camp. The Mexicans came in, in crowds, with fruit, vegetables, flowers, and other articles, which they bartered with the Spaniards. They brought news that the Mexican governor of the province intended to visit them the next day. Before noon, he arrived with his numerous suite. A banquet was served to them, and then, in answer to the cazique's inquiries as to the objects of their visit, he was informed by Cortes that he was the subject of a great monarch beyond the seas, who ruled over a vast empire, and that, hearing of the greatness of the Mexican emperor, he had sent him as an envoy, with a present in token of his good will, and a message which he must deliver in person. The cazique said that he would send couriers with the royal gift to Montezuma, and that, as soon as he had learned his will, he would communicate it. He then presented ten slave loads of fine cottons, mantles of rich feather work, and a basket filled with gold ornaments to Cortes, who then handed over the presents intended for Montezuma. These consisted of a richly carved and painted armchair, a crimson cap with a gold medal, and a quantity of collars, bracelets, and other ornaments of cut glass. Cortes observed one of the cazique's attendants busy sketching, and found that he was drawing the Spaniards, their costumes, and arms. This was the picture-writing of the Aztecs, and the chief informed him that the pictures would be sent to Montezuma. In order to impress the monarch, Cortes ordered the cavalry to manoeuvre, 
and the cannon to be fired and these exhibitions as well as the ships were faithfully depicted by the artist the chief then took his leave eight days later an embassy arrived from montezuma with an enormous quantity of extremely valuable presents shields helmets cuirasses collars and bracelets of gold crests of variegated feathers sprinkled with pearls and precious stones birds and animal in excellent workmanship in gold and silver curtains coverings and robes of the finest cotton of rich colours interwoven with marvellous feather work among the presents were two circular plates of gold and silver as large as cart wheels the value of the silver wheel was estimated at five thousand pounds that of the gold one at fifty five thousand the spaniards were astounded at this display of treasure and delighted at the prospect it opened to them the ambassadors however brought a message from the emperor saying that he regretted much that he could not have a personal interview with them the distance from his capital being too great and the journey beset with difficulties and dangers and that all that could be done therefore was for them to return to their own land with the proofs thus afforded of his friendly disposition cortez was much mortified by the refusal but requested the envoys to lay before the emperor his immense desire for a personal interview with him and that the dangers of a short land journey were as nothing to one who had accomplished so long a voyage over the sea to see him the mexicans repeated their assurance that his application would be unavailing and left with some coldness of manner the effect of their displeasure at the insistence of the spaniards was soon manifest the natives ceasing to bring in provisions while awaiting the emperor's reply the soldiers suffered greatly from the heat and the effluvia from the neighbouring marshes thirty died and as the anchorage was exposed to the northern gales cortez decided to sail north as soon as the answer to his last application was received and sent off two vessels to see where a safe port could be found ten days after the departure of the envoys they returned with a large quantity of fresh presents but with a positive refusal on the part of the emperor to allow them to advance near the capital and a request that now they had obtained what they most desired they would at once return to their own country four days later the ships returned with the news that they had found but one sheltered port and that the country round it was well watered and favourable for a camp the soldiers however were now growing discontented the treasure already acquired was large the unhealthiness of the climate had alarmed them and the proofs of the wealth and greatness of the mexican empire had convinced them that it needed a vastly larger force than that which cortez had under his orders to undertake an expedition against it for the courage showed by the tabascans had proved conclusively that ill armed as they were the natives were not to be despised fortunately for cortez five indians made their appearance in camp one morning their dress and appearance were wholly different from those of the aztecs and they spoke a different language but malinche who had been baptized and christened marina by father olmedo the leading priest of the expedition found that two of them could converse in aztec they said that they were totonacs and had come from sempaola their capital they had been but recently conquered by the aztecs and were so oppressed by them that they were anxious to throw off their yoke and they came to ask the wonderful strangers of whom they had heard to visit them cortez at once saw the immense importance of the communication hitherto he had regarded the mexican empire as a great and united power against which success with so small a force was impossible but now that he saw it was composed of subjugated peoples many of whom would gladly ally themselves with him against their conquerors 
the enterprise wore a far more hopeful aspect. He dismissed the Indians with presents, and a promise to visit their country shortly. He talked the matter over with his principal friends, who were as reluctant as he was himself to abandon the enterprise and return to Cuba, where the governor would appropriate the largest share of the spoils they had taken. They accordingly went about among the soldiery, urging them to persuade the general to establish a permanent colony in the country. It was true that he had no authority from Velasquez to do so, but the interests of the emperor and of Spain, to say nothing of their own, were of more importance than those of the governor of Cuba. This talk reached the ears of the special friends and adherents of Velasquez, who, going to Cortes, remonstrated with him against such proceedings. He said that nothing was farther from his desires than to exceed his instructions, and on the following morning issued a proclamation to the troops, ordering them to prepare for embarkation. The sensation caused among the troops was great, and his partisans thronged round his tent, calling upon him to countermand his orders and form a settlement. Cortes, after due hesitation, gave in to their wishes, nominated magistrates, and proclaimed the territory a colony of Spain. As soon as the new magistrates and officers came together, Cortes came before them, and tendered his resignation of his office as captain-general, but was renominated not only captain-general, but chief justice of the colony. The partisans of Velasquez were most indignant at the whole proceedings, and so violent were some of the leaders that Cortes put them in irons and sent them on board ship. Then he set to work with the soldiers, and soon brought them round, and the prisoners on board being also won over, the whole army, re-embarking, sailed up the coast until they reached the port before discovered, and landing set out for Sempoala. They were delighted with the country, which was rich and fertile, and as they neared the town, the natives poured out with lively demonstrations of welcome, the women throwing garlands of flowers round the necks of the soldiers. They were greatly struck with the town, although it was but a small place in comparison with those they were afterwards to see. Cortes lost no time in sending off a vessel to Spain, with dispatches to the emperor and his influence over the soldiers was so great that they, as well as the officers, relinquished all their shares of the treasure they had gained, in order that a worthy present should be sent home to their monarch. In his dispatches, Cortes related all that had befallen them, dilated on the prospect of annexing so rich a country to the Spanish dominions, and asked for a confirmation of his acts and for an authorization for the magistrates of the new town, which was called Villa Rica de Vera Cruz. The ship touched at Cuba, but continued its voyage before Velasquez, who was furious at the news of the important discoveries made by Cortes, could stop it. Scarcely had the ship sailed when Cortes discovered that a conspiracy was on foot among the partisans of Velasquez, to seize one of the vessels and to sail away to Cuba. The conspirators were seized, two of them executed, and others flogged. But the discovery that there were a number of timid spirits in the camp, who might seriously interfere with his plans, greatly annoyed Cortes, and he took the extraordinary resolution of destroying all the ships. Through some of his devoted friends, he bribed the captains of the vessels to fall in with his views, and they appeared before him, and made a solemn report that the ships were worm-eaten and unfit for sea. Cortes pretended great surprise, and ordered everything movable to be brought ashore, and the ships to be sunk. Nine vessels were so destroyed, and all but one craft was left afloat. When the news reached the troops at Sempoala, they were filled with consternation. 
it seemed to them that nothing but destruction awaited them, and from murmurings they broke out into mutiny. Cortez, however, as usual, speedily allayed the tumult. He pointed out that his loss was the greatest, since the ships were his property, and that the troops would in fact derive great advantage by it, since it would swell their force by a hundred men, who must otherwise have remained in charge of the vessels. He urged them to place their confidence in him, and they might rely upon it that success would attend their efforts. If there were any cowards there, they might take the remaining ship and sail to Cuba with it, and wait patiently there until the army returned, laden with the spoils of the Aztecs. The troops at once returned to their duty, and declared their readiness to follow him, wheresoever he would. Without further delay, Cortez, taking with him a number of natives to act as carriers, set out on his march towards Mexico. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of With Cortez in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Twelve The Fugitives. At nightfall, Roger and his guide continued their journey but now moved with great caution, keeping but a short distance from the road. Several times they saw fires burning, and had to take long detours to avoid them. Consequently, the moon had set when they were still more than ten miles from the pass. Next morning they continued their journey, avoiding as much as possible crossing tracts of cultivated land, and, when forced to do so, lying down and crawling between the rows of the maize or yuccas. They are sure to have scouts high up on the mountainside, Bethalda said, and they thence can look down upon all these fields, and although as we cross them we are perfectly hidden from people standing on this same level, they can see us clearly enough from there. The distance is very great to make out a man. The air is very clear, my lord, in these mountains, and a figure can be seen a vast distance off. However, we can do nothing but what we are doing, and must take our chance. If we are attacked, Roger said, we must make straight up the mountains. Steep as they may be, there are few places where active men cannot climb, and numbers would avail nothing if we once got up among those heights." They were now mounting rapidly towards the pass. The country was still thickly wooded, but Bathalda said that in the narrowest part of the pass there were no trees, and it was here that the danger would be greatest. As they neared the mouth of the gorge, they moved with the greatest care, keeping their eyes in every direction. Presently Bathalda stopped and held up his hand. Roger listened. They are coming behind us, Bethalda said. They must have made us out in the distance, and have sent a party down the road to enter the wood behind us, and so prevent us from retreating. Then we had better bear away to the left, Bethalda. They are sure to be in force in the pass, and since they are behind us also, our only hope is to try and scale the hill to the left. Bethalda, without a word, moved forward in the direction indicated. The trees grew thinner in front, and through them they could see rocky ground rising steeply up. They issued out and began to climb, when the sound of a horn rose loudly in the air, and a moment afterwards a number of men were seen, running from the right, along the edge of the trees. "'They will not shoot,' Roger said. "'They want to take me alive. Never mind their arrows.' It is a question of legs at present. The rocks were extremely steep, and in many places they had to use their hands, as well as their feet, in making the ascent. The Aztecs, who had, on first seeing them, broken into loud cries, were now silent, 
and were toiling up the hillside in pursuit now roger said after a very severe piece of climbing we must stop them he strung his bow and placing an arrow to the string shouted to the aztecs that he should shoot unless they desisted from pursuit they paid no attention their officer shouting to them to press on they were now less than a hundred yards behind roger drew his bow to the fullest and the arrow whizzed through the air it struck the officer in the throat and he fell prone a cry of astonishment broke from the soldiers however they did not hesitate a moment but pushed on with loud shouts roger discharged six arrows in rapid succession and five of them flew true to the mark the aztecs paused the distance to which the arrows were sent and the accuracy of the shooting struck them with consternation and it was evident to them that before they could climb the steep ascent the greater portion of them would be shot down some took shelter behind rocks and began to discharge their arrows others fell back in haste now we will begin moving on again bathalda roger said we have taught them a lesson of caution they proceeded on their way until they reached a shoulder which led straight up the mountain just as they stopped to draw breath there was a shout and a party of twenty men who had evidently climbed straight up from the pass to cut them off rushed at them roger rapidly discharged five arrows into the midst of them and then slipped the string from the notch and seized the bamboo as a quarterstaff at the order of their leader the aztecs threw down their spears and flung themselves on him with the intention of dragging him to the ground but making his quarterstaff swing round his head he brought the ends down upon them with tremendous force striking them to the ground as if they had been ninepins bathalda seconded him well by guarding him from attack behind finding that in spite of his efforts he could not keep back his assailants roger threw down the quarterstaff and seized his axe four more of them fell cleft through the head and then four of them sprang upon him together but roger's practice in devonshire wrestling now stood him in good service and although in a moment the four were hanging upon him they could neither get him off his legs nor hold his arms and he beat three of them down with heavy blows on their faces while bathalda freed him from one on his back by a thrust with his spear roger again caught up the axe which he had let fall to have the use of both of his fists but the fight was over the five aztecs still remaining on their feet appalled at the to them supernatural strength of their gigantic foe fled to join their comrades who had now nearly reached the crest on which the combat had taken place come on bathalda roger exclaimed we have not a moment to lose they will shoot now seeing that they have little chance of taking me alive and they accordingly started up the steep ascent as rapidly as their breathless condition would allow their pursuers paused a moment on gaining the brow to get their wind and then followed but as soon as the ground again became too steep to allow of rapid movement roger turned and betaking himself to his bow and arrows speedily checked the pursuit the aztecs being unable to stand against these terrible weapons whose force and accuracy seemed to them supernatural the sight too of the heap of their comrades lying on the slope had greatly cooled their courage their officers had all fallen under roger's arrows together with most of their bravest comrades and although the rest still continued the pursuit it was at a distance that showed that they had no intention whatever of closing again paying no further heed to them roger and his companion now directed their whole attention to the work of climbing at times they came on perpendicular precipices and had to make long detours to surmount them after some hours labor they reached the snow they were now near a shoulder between two lofty peaks and after an hour's climbing stood on its crest the aztecs were now mere spots far behind them they will be an hour before they are here roger said we need fear no more trouble with them 
It was a sharp fight while it lasted, Bethalda. These were the first words they had spoken, beyond a momentary consultation, now and then, as to the best mode of surmounting difficulties. "'My lord is wonderful,' the hunter said. "'Never did I see such strength and skill. It was like a mountain tiger attacked by jackals. You did your share, too, Bethalda. Your spear rid me of several of them. I did what I could, my lord, but that was little enough. A few men like you would defeat an army.' Well, Bethalda, now we will be moving on again. We will keep straight down this slope until we are off the snow, for they can follow our footsteps. Beyond that, we must press on until we get into the woods again, and there we can turn right or left as we please, and throw them off the scent altogether. We shall then be safe until we reach the forest, and begin to descend into the hot country. Another hour, and they had left the snow behind them and after two more hours on the rocky hillside they again entered a forest. As soon as they were well among the trees they turned to the right again, and after travelling through the wood for two or three miles they halted, secure now against any search on the part of their pursuers. Just before halting they had the good luck to come across a small bear, which Roger wounded with an arrow, and his companion dispatched with his spear. Bethalda speedily made a fire by rubbing two sticks together, and after skinning the bear, cut it up, and while Roger was superintending the roasting of some pieces over the fire, Bethalda searched in the wood, and speedily returned with some roots, which he placed in the ashes, and which turned out excellent eating with the bear's flesh. As it was now far on in the afternoon, and as they had already performed a very fatiguing day's work, they resolved to wait where they were until the morning. "'What do you think would be our best course now?' Roger asked, after they had eaten their meal, and were stretched close to the fire for warmth, for at this elevation the cold was great. Bethalda did not reply, but sat pouring out volumes of smoke from the pipe he had just filled. At last Roger repeated the question, "'I am ready to go where my lord wills.' "'Yes, Bethalda, but that is no answer to my question. You know the ways of your people, and I do not. We have had a sharp fight with them today. What is likely to come of it? Bethalda shook his head. The news will, long before this, have been sent by swift runners to every town and village on the slope of the mountains. The garrisons of Parote, Tietlong Quidapac, Zalapa, and Nalinko will all be in movement. Nalinko is but some eight or ten miles away down the pass, and not only the soldiers, but every man in the town will be ordered out. They will be posted as thick as blades of grass at the mouth of every valley leading down from the mountains. You have resisted the emperor's officers and have killed numbers of his soldiers. They will know that the wrath of Montezuma will be terrible if they fail to arrest you then you think that it will almost be impossible to make our way through them? Bethalda nodded his head. And in time, I suppose, they will search these woods, every foot of them, wide though they are, my lord. Then what is your advice, Bethalda? It depends whether my lord's mind is altogether set upon joining the white men of the sea at once. Roger, in turn, was silent for a time. The Spaniards would have learned the wealth of the land. It was not likely they would speedily depart. But if they did, it would only be to return again, in far greater force than at present. Other opportunities would occur for rejoining them, and it would be folly to throw away his life and that of his companion in an attempt that the latter evidently felt to be desperate. He had already had proof of the vigilance of the Aztec scouts, and doubtless that vigilance would now be redoubled. No, Bethalda, he replied at last, I should be content to remain in hiding for a time, and to risk the departure of the white men. Then, my lord, my advice is that we retrace our steps across to the other side of the mountains, then we will head north, avoiding the towns, and take refuge for a time in the forests that stretch for many leagues over the mountains. There we can build a hut and hunt. 
there are turkeys and other game in abundance from time to time i can go down to a town and gather news and bring back such things as may be necessary for you then when the search for you abates we can strike down thence to the seacoast if the white men are still there at any rate we can live by hunting as long as you may find it necessary to remain in concealment that will be by far the best plan bathalda i have no objection to a few weeks of life in the woods and you can teach me your craft of a hunter what do you say shall we start back this evening if my lord is not too wearied it would be well if we could get across the crust before morning they will have sentries at every point whence they can command a view of the hills and our figures could be made out on the snow at a great distance away i should have preferred a night's rest bathalda but it would be foolish to lose a day and no doubt parties will be searching the woods in the morning we have still four hours before the sun goes down and that should be enough to fit us for starting again the hunter was pleased at roger's decision let my lord sleep at once he said i will watch i am accustomed to long journeys and to pass my nights in search of game it is nothing to me i used dry sticks for the fire and but little smoke will have made its way through the trees still it may possibly be noticed and it were best one of us should remain on watch roger felt that he should never be able to make the ascent over the crest of the hill unless he had some rest and therefore without argument he wrapped himself in his cotton mantle and lay down before the fire it seemed to him that he had but just closed his eyes when his companion touched him it is time that we should be moving my lord the sun has just set why it appears to me to be night already bathalda it has been dark here for the last hour my lord but on the other side of the mountains the sun has but now gone down see the full moon has just risen in the east that is so bathalda and we shall have her light until morning well i am ready though i could have slept on comfortably until sunrise have you heard anything i have heard the sound of horns far down the hillside but nothing near us save animals disturbed by the voices below and passing up towards the rocks i have cooked some more flesh it is always best to make a good meal when one can we have a rough journey before us and the cold will be great fortunately the air is still were it blowing i should say that there was less danger in waiting here than in crossing the mountain the meal was quickly eaten bathalda slung a large piece of bear's flesh over his shoulder and they started so bright was the moonlight that they had no more difficulty in climbing than if it had been day and after six hours of severe toil they again came down upon the forest on the other side of the mountains they proceeded among the trees for some little distance till they came to some very thick undergrowth where bathalda thought it would be perfectly safe to light a fire this he accordingly did as roger said he would rather run any danger than go without a fire in spite of the exertions they had made they were chilled to the bone their clothes were stiff with the frozen moisture from their bodies and the cotton mantles offered but small protection against the cold a pleasant glow stole over them as the fire burnt up i will watch now bathalda and you shall sleep i do not think that there is any danger my lord they believe us among the woods on the other side of the mountains and it is not at all likely there will be any vigilant watch kept upon this side we can both sleep without fear roger was glad to hear his companion's opinion and in a few minutes was fast asleep when he awoke it was day bathalda was cooking some flesh over the embers of the fire you have been asleep i hope bathalda roger said as he rose to his feet and shook himself i have slept my lord the hunter said although in fact it was not until morning began to break that he had relaxed his watchfulness we will be off as soon as we have eaten it is possible that parties may as soon as it is daybreak go along by the edge of the snow line to assure themselves that we are still on the other side of the mountain 
and if so they will probably come across our footsteps therefore we had best be moving at once two long days marches took them deep into the woods lying north of tlatlanquitepec here they set to work to construct a rough hut of boughs near a mountain spring and when this was completed they set to work hunting turkeys abounded these they generally obtained by shooting them at night as they roosted in the trees but they sometimes hunted them by day bathalda imitating their call so accurately that they came up within easy shot of them without the least suspicion of danger they killed several small bears which were useful not only for their flesh but for the warmth of their skins at night once or twice they shot deer and obtained other game in abundance at night they frequently heard the roar of the mountain tiger once or twice when the sounds approached too close to their hut they left it and took refuge in trees as the hunter said that even roger's arrows would scarcely slay these fierce beasts at once and that when wounded they were terrible enemies roger enjoyed the life much the air was fresh and bracing the forest magnificent in its varied foliage and the abundance of game so great that it needed no special exertion to keep themselves well supplied with food two or three times at intervals of a week or ten days bathalda went down to tlatlanquitepec with a load of turkeys and other game slung on a pole over his shoulder and returned with maize flour chocolate and pulque and other articles of food and which was of much greater importance to roger news of the white strangers the first time he learned that they had arrived in several floating castles and had landed at once the natives had received them with kindness and the chief of that district Teulile, had on the following day had an interview with their chief presents had been exchanged five days later an embassy with many very rich gifts from the emperor arrived at the camp they were the bearers of friendly messages from montezuma who however had declined to allow them to proceed into the country and had requested them to leave the coast at once the white men had sent back a message to montezuma praying him to alter his determination and showed no signs of obeying his orders and re-embarking on board their ships by the orders of montezuma's envoys the people had now abstained from visiting the camp or bringing in supplies three weeks after bathalda returned from the town with the news that another embassy from montezuma had visited the white camp with another great store of valuable presents but that montezuma positively prohibited them advancing towards the capital two days later they were visited by envoys from campoalea the chief town of the totonacs who had been lately conquered by the aztecs and had invited the white men to visit their city they had accordingly marched there and were now dwelling in this town it was said that the aztecs were extremely indignant at the action of the totonacs and that dire vengeance would be taken upon them for daring to act in this manner without the permission of montezuma the next news was that the white men had marched further north to chiahutzla that they were founding a city there and that they had actually seized and imprisoned a party of aztec envoys the white men had visited other towns and at campoalea had insulted the gods rolled the idols down from the tops of the temples and had erected altars to their own gods there this act had created a profound impression throughout the country and the greatest astonishment was felt that montezuma did not at once put his armies in motion to crush these profane and insolent strangers a still greater sensation had been caused by the news that the spaniards had destroyed all their floating castles and that it was therefore evident that they intended to remain permanently in the land this news greatly surprised roger the reports were unanimous that there were at the utmost but three or four hundred of the whites and that the spaniards should dream of matching themselves against the whole force of mexico seemed almost incredible 
how do the white men communicate with the natives roger asked they have with them some slaves whom they obtained at tabasco among them was one who was a mexican by race they say that the white men speak to another white man who understands the language of tabasco and that he speaks to this young woman who speaks in mexican what she is told she is treated with great honor by the white men what is her name did you hear the natives say she is called malinche but the white men call her marina that is good news indeed bathalda roger said for when i was at tabasco i knew a mexican slave girl of that name and if it is the same she will befriend us it was nearly three weeks before roger again obtained news bathalda had injured his leg in a fall down a precipice while stalking a deer and was obliged to lie up in the hut for more than a fortnight as soon as he was well enough to get about again he joined roger in a turkey hunt and started the next day for the city he returned with surprising news the white men had marched from the coast through nalinco and the pass of obispo they had been everywhere well received by the natives who all belonged to the totonic tribe they had gone to yataka maxtitlan a great city where they had stayed three days they had then marched on towards tlascala the republic that had so long resisted the strength of all mexico they were said to number four hundred foot and fifteen strange creatures who were partly man and partly some fleet animal and they had seven great black tubes that made thunder thirteen hundred totonic fighting men accompanied them and a thousand porters to drag the tubes and carry their baggage they had sent embassies to the tlascalans but the latter had chosen war and there had been some terrible battles fought but the white men were invincible and had defeated the tlascalans with great slaughter and the news had arrived only that morning that they had captured the city the sensation throughout the country was that of stupefaction. It seemed absolutely incredible that a state which had successfully defied the armies of Montezuma and his predecessors should, after four or five days of fighting, be overthrown by this handful of white strangers. There seemed but one comfort. It was said that several of the whites had been killed, and this showed at least that they were not superhuman creatures and that it might yet be possible to destroy them no sooner did roger hear the news than he determined to start at once to join the spaniards who were already far to the west accordingly the next morning at daybreak he started with bathalda and late on the following afternoon arrived in sight of tlascala they thought it better not to enter the city until the following morning and therefore passed the night in a clump of bushes the next day they boldly entered the town the city was a large one divided into four quarters separated by lofty walls and each ruled over by one of the four great chiefs of the republic its population was very large and the town was strongly and solidly built at ordinary times the appearance of two seeming aztecs in the streets would have been the signal for their instant destruction but at the present time the people were solely occupied with the presence of their white conquerors with whom as roger soon learned they had made treaties of friendship and whom they now viewed as friends and allies the whole of the spaniards were lodged in one of the palaces the crowd of people proceeding in that direction was a sufficient index to its position and roger and his companion joining the throng were soon in front of the palace some spanish soldiers were standing as sentries at its gate but none came out or mixed with the people cortez having given the strictest orders that they should remain in their quarters as he feared that did they go abroad some brawl might arise between them and the inhabitants and so break the newly formed alliance which was of the most extreme importance to them presently some spanish officers and several richly dressed chiefs came out from the palace the people raised a shout and it was evident to roger that in spite of the terrible losses suffered by their troops in the attacks upon the white men their admiration for their visitors 
far outweighed any animosity for the defeats inflicted upon them near the officer whom roger judged to be the leader of the expedition were an elderly man and a young woman the spaniard addressed the old man who spoke to the girl and she translated it to the chiefs roger recognized her at once it was certainly his friend the slave girl of tabasco in the eight months since he had seen her she had grown to complete womanhood and now richly attired as she was and evidently regarded as a person of great importance both by the spaniards and the native chiefs carried herself with an air of confidence and pride and was roger thought the most beautiful woman he had seen in mexico as the party moved down the steps of the palace and along the street evidently discoursing on some important business roger followed them closely he waited until malinche happened for a moment to be at the outside of the party then he pressed forward and said to her malinche do you remember your white friend she looked up and would have cried out with astonishment had he not touched his lips i want to speak with you alone first where can i meet you in an hour i shall be able to slip away from their meal she said be near the palace gate roger at once fell back into the crowd and soon took an opportunity to extricate himself from it and to go down a side street he and bathalda then ascended to the top of the wall where they were likely to be undisturbed and waited there for an hour they then went back to the palace the square in the front of it was almost deserted now for the spaniards had retired half an hour before and were not likely to appear again until the evening especially as it was known that at noon there was to be a great council held in the palace ten minutes later malinche appeared at the entrance as soon as her eyes fell on roger she raised her hand and leaving bathalda he at once went up to her the two sentinels looked with some surprise at this tall native but as they saw that he was known to malinche they offered no opposition to his entering the palace with her she led him down some corridors and then out into a garden as soon as she saw that they were in a spot where they could not be overlooked she turned and seized his hands and would have pressed them to her forehead had not roger prevented her doing so and put her hands to his lips ah she exclaimed how happy you have made me to-day i have wondered so much how it has fared with you and have dreamed at night so often that you were being sacrificed on the altars of the gods i have thought of you very often also malinche and i was surprised indeed when i heard that you for i felt sure that it was you were with the spaniards and were not only an interpreter but in high honor with them but why do you not join them she asked why do you come to me first what can i do for you i will take you at once to cortez and when i tell him that you are my friend and were so kind and good to the slave girl he will welcome you most warmly yes malinche but that is why i wanted to see you first alone you remember that i told you all about the spaniards and how they owned the islands and would some day surely come to mexico but that i belong to another white people who are forbidden by the spaniards under pain of death to come to these parts they must not know that i am not of their nation you see i cannot speak their tongue i see that you have learned it fast for i saw cortez speaking to you what are we to do then the girl asked with a puzzled look when they find that you cannot speak their language they will of course see that you are not of their people yes malinche but they might think that i had forgotten it that is just where i want you to help me if you take me to cortez and tell him that years ago a ship was wrecked on the coast of tabasco and that all were drowned except a little white boy and that he was brought up at tabasco and that you were great friends with him until he was sold to some mexican traders they will think that i have altogether forgotten my native language they are not likely to ask you how many years ago it is or how big i was then and will imagine that i was quite a child and that i belonged to a spanish ship for they will not dream of an english vessel 
having been in these parts. When you introduce me to Cortez, you must tell him that I have quite forgotten the language, save a few words, for I picked up a few sentences when in their ports. They will easily believe that you may have been wrecked, said Malinche, for they rescued a man who had been living many years among a tribe at Yucatan to the west of Tabasco. There were other white men living among them, though these they could not recover. You saw him by me this morning. He is an old man, a priest, and he translates from the Spanish into the Yucatan dialect, which is so like that of Tabasco that I can understand it. And then I tell the people in Mexican. There will be no difficulty at all. Cortez and the Spaniards know that I love them, and they trust me altogether, and I am able to do good to my country people and to intercede with them sometimes with Cortez. Now tell me what has happened since I last saw you. Roger gave her a sketch of what had happened in Mexico and how he had escaped, by flight, from being sacrificed. It is terrible, these sacrifices, Malincha said, shuddering. I did not think so in the old days, but I have learned better from the Spaniards and from their priests, and I rejoice that the white men will destroy these horrible idols, and will teach the people to worship the great God and his son. They will suffer, my heart bleeds to think how they will suffer, but it will be good for them in the end, and put a stop to rivers of blood that flow every year at their altars." Although Roger was not imbued with the passion for conversion which animated the Spaniards and led them to believe that it was the most glorious of all duties to force their religion upon the natives, he had been so filled with horror at the wholesale sacrifices of human victims and the cannibal feasts that followed them that he was in no way disposed to question the methods which the Spaniards adopted to put a stop to such abominations but for the friendship of Kakama, he would himself assuredly have been a victim to these sanguinary gods. He and his father had, like the Beggs and many other of his friends at Plymouth, been secretly followers of Wycliffe, but they were still Catholics. They believed that there were many and deep abuses in the church, but had no thought of abandoning it altogether. The doings of the Inquisition in Spain were regarded by all Englishmen with horror, but these excesses were as nothing to the wholesale horrors of the Mexican religion. He talked for some time with Malincha and saw that she was completely devoted to the Spaniards and regarded Cortez as a hero, almost more than mortal, and was in no slight degree relieved at observing that, although ready to be friendly in every way and evidently still much attached to him, the warmer feeling which she had testified at their parting no longer existed, but had been transferred to her present friends and protectors. "'Come with me,' she said at last. "'The meal will be over now. I will take you to an apartment near the banqueting hall, and will leave you there while I tell Cortez about you, and will then lead you to him.' Seeing how confident Malincha was as to the reception she could procure for him, Roger awaited her return to the chamber where she had placed him, with little anxiety. In a quarter of an hour she returned, and beckoned him to follow. "'I have told him,' she said, "'it did not seem to him strange that some vessel should have been driven by the storms and wrecked here. He asked no questions as to how many years ago it was. I told him you were a young boy at the time, and have forgotten all but a few words of the language, and how when you grew to be a man, you were sold to some Mexican merchants, and would have been sacrificed to the gods, had you not made your escape. As I had told him before that there had been a white man living at Tabasco, who had been very good to me, he was not surprised at the story. She took Roger to an apartment in which Cortez and several of his principal officers were standing. As Malincha had told them that he was painted, and disguised as a native, they were not surprised at his appearance, although his height, which was far beyond that attained by Spaniards, somewhat astonished them. Roger approached the group, and at once fell on one knee before Cortez, took his hand and kissed it. Cortez raised him, and embraced him warmly. 
i am delighted to find another of my countrymen he said and all the more since marina tells me that she knows you well and that you were most kind and good to her senor roger said in broken spanish i do not understand i have forgotten you will soon recover it cortez said tell him aquilar that he will soon learn to speak his native language again the interpreter repeated the words to roger in the yucatan dialect adding that he himself had been a prisoner for eight years among the natives and that although a man when captured by them had with difficulty spoken spanish when restored to his friends but it had now quite come back to him you were but a boy when you were wrecked marina tells me cortez said only a boy roger repeated when marina translated this to him do you remember anything of spain cortez asked roger shut his eyes as if considering i seem to have a remembrance he said of a place with great many ships it was a city built on a rock rising from the sea it had high walls with great guns upon them which fired sometimes with a terrible noise when vessels came in and out when this was translated by aquilar cortez said it was cadiz of course doubtless the ship he was wrecked in sailed from that port a murmur of assent passed round the other spaniards show him across aquilar see if he remembers his religion aquilar took out a cross from under his doublet and held it out towards roger who after looking at it for a moment fell on his knees and kissed it he remembers much you see cortez said father aquilar you will succeed soon in making a good catholic of him again well gentlemen i think we may congratulate ourselves upon this new companion every arm is of assistance and if he is as brave as he is big and strong he will prove a doughty comrade besides he will be able to tell us something of mexico although as marina says he was only once at the capital question him aquilar and find out from him whether its magnificence is as great as we hear roger told all he knew of the capital and said that although he himself could not say more than that it was a great city he had heard that its population was nearly three hundred thousand and that it certainly seemed to him fully three times as that of tezcuco where he said there were one hundred thousand people and it stands on an island in a lake cortez asked there are three causeways leading to the land each wide enough for six horsemen to ride abreast roger replied but it would be a difficult thing to force an entrance by these in the face of montezuma's army well gentlemen cortez said it is time for us to be going to the council marina do you take your friend to my private apartment and bid juan furnish him with a suit of clothes and with armor from that belonging to our friends who fell in the fights the other day we will soon make a true cavalier of him as soon as roger was equipped he went out to the steps of the palace and presently descried bathalda in the crowd he beckoned to him and taking him into the garden had a long talk with him he would have rewarded him largely for his services but bathalda refused to accept anything i came at my lord's orders he said and am rejoiced to have been of service to one who is at once so kind so strong and so valiant as you will we shall have further opportunities of meeting bathalda do you now make your way back to tezcuco tell your lord all that has happened and that i am with the spaniards and shall accompany them if as i believe they go forward to mexico that i hope to see all my friends again before long and that i always think of their kindness to me End of chapter 12